Jeff Dorman, CIO of Arca, back again for another edition of That's Our Two Satoshis Live, where we talk about everything happening in the crypto markets for the week. Uh, and for those who'd like to read, uh, obviously, you can go to our blog, ar.ca backslash blog. Uh, and before we get started, uh, quick disclaimer, none of this is investment advice, which is too bad because I got someone really smart on here who you probably do want to take investment advice from. Uh, I got Josh Lim, who I've known really since both of us kind of entered crypto, what, seven, eight years ago. Uh, founder of Arbolos Markets, which is a crypto trading firm focused on derivatives. Uh, you can find more about them on their website, arbolos.xyz. But really, more importantly, uh, I hope you follow him on Twitter uh, at Joshua underscore J underscore Lim, because he wrote probably the definitive thread talking about uh, what it means with the SEC approval of IBIT options. And, and truthfully, Josh, the reason I wanted to have you on, um, you know, for those who have been following me for a week or for, for following me every week for, for years now, like I usually write about the markets. I wrote a lot about macro last week and kind of like, you know, what's bullish, what's bearish. Um, and, and I'm not seeing the, the, the crux of it is everything macro wise is incredibly bullish. Everything crypto specific is just not that interesting until I read your thread and I realized, oh, I missed a big one here. And, and, and I'll be I'll, I'll be honest, I, I dismissed the news about the options uh, trading on iBit because as a crypto native firm, we used Arabit and Arabit's fine. And I totally didn't understand the, the, you know, what, why this is so impactful until I read what you had to, what, what you had to say. So, I'm a believer, and I think that it'd be great for you. First of all, hi, thanks for joining. Uh, it'd be great for you to help uh, all the viewers here understand, like, why is this so impactful? What does it mean? And what kind of size are we talking about in terms of volume and impact on the market? Yeah, Jeff, thanks for having me. It's uh, yeah, it's been a while. We've been working together. First time uh, joining you on this thing. So very, very glad to be a part. Um, yeah, I think, you know, when I saw the news come out, I was still in um, I was actually in Singapore for the conference. And like you, right, I think everyone at that conference was trying to make some sense of the last couple of months in crypto. And, you know, even though everything was um nominally at near all-time high levels right it kind of felt like we were in the doldrums um a little bit and and you know we were trying to find a good narrative around crypto what i think is um the most exciting part of the next uh few months here is there's going to be some shift in market structure right and that shift in market structure is going to be partially driven by these etf options once they get approved um and listed and, and you know ready to trade accessible to all of those market participants and i think what is um going to drive that market structure change is not necessarily what has been highlighted in a lot of the other kind of breathless narratives on crypto twitter which is a lot of people are excited about the access to these products from retail users, from specifically like the Robinhood type, you know, zero days to expiry type of trader, um, which, you know, in other circumstances have driven these sort of extreme hyperbolic moves like we've seen on GameStop and AMC and, uh, and other meme stocks. Well, I, mean, I mean, there's no there's no question there's a more of a gambling culture in finance than there ever was before, right? With those, you know, the, the zero day options, the, the advent of Robinhood, things like meme stocks, but even just, you know, even if you just look at poly market, I mean, there's just there's just more gambling in general on finance. And I think you're right. I think that would be what I initially thought would be like, oh, OK, you know, vol on vol. Right. You already have a super high vol asset and now you get to have even more vol on top of it with these options. But but you seem to think there's there's more structure than just that. Right. Yeah. And, and look, it's not that I want to be dismissive of that, because that is a powerful force that drives a lot of what we see in crypto, right? That that idea of reflexivity, the the power of um, you know collective belief in this instrument, in this asset being a store of value, right? And it goes up because of that belief, and then that belief causes it to go up even more, which then reinforces the fact that it can be a store of value because so many people are ascribing that value to it. So, um, not dismissing that fact at all. And I think that is actually fundamentally what carries Bitcoin higher, you know, to all time highs is that idea that it can be a non sovereign store of value that we all need to use day to day in our lives as a as a way to exchange value on the Internet. Um, but there are kind of like these five points that we I highlighted in this thread that I put together that sort of dive a little bit deeper below the surface changes in the market structure that make crypto more robust as a tradable asset and 
therefore makes it easier for institutional investors to allocate to it and for, you know, more and more people to adopt it as a as a uh, part of their portfolios. Well, so let's go, let's go through that, whether you go through all five or just pick the, the highlights of it. I mean, explain those in, in more detail, because I would imagine, you know, not everybody who listens to this, not everybody who reads what we write is necessarily a finance expert, right? I think most people probably understand Black Shoals. They certainly understand the idea of what buying or selling an option means. Um, but probably certainly don't understand the depth of the sec lending market and collateral, uh, as well as even just you know how important the market makers are, you know of, of what you wrote. And again, I would encourage everybody to go to Josh's Twitter and read the whole thread. But but what what do you think the two or three most impactful uh, points are with regard to the listing of these uh, IBIT options? Yeah. So the first thing is there are existing option markets in crypto and. Those option markets are accessible to folks like you and me, you know, the ones that are um, trading it as crypto natives that are very comfortable using offshore exchanges um, and whose instruments are generally denominated in crypto in instruments themselves. Right. So it's Bitcoin denominated or ETH denominated options. Um, Deribit is the most notable example of such a venue. Deribit trades about $40 billion notional per month, which is which is quite sizable. And I think a lot of people outside of crypto may not understand that there's already such a liquid market. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also used by a lot of pretty sophisticated trading firms already, like all the firms that you would find in traditional markets, you know, vol arbitrage firms that are looking for pricing dislocations at different points in the vol surface, all the way to just directional funds that want to get, you know, maybe cheaper exposure to upside by using a call spread, things like that, things that you can only kind of structure with options. Right. Now, that market already exists. The addition of ETF options is only only going to enhance liquidity throughout the entire ecosystem. So what we're expecting to see is just a huge uptick in volume across existing crypto native markets like Deribit, across the CME options, which already exist today. They, they actually started trading in 2020, so they've been around for quite a while. That is about a tenth of the size of the Deribit market today. But given the fact that ETF options and the CME options are basically going to live in the same world. They're accessible to institutional investors like Wall Street types that are using um, prime brokers to hold or, or um, FCMs um, to hold these instruments in the same place. They're going to be netted against each other, which results in like more arbitrage. Right. Yeah, and I think and I think that's the biggest point there, because, you know, for instance, if you're a crypto native fund and all you do is focus on tokens, there's really no reason to ever use anything other than Deribit because you're allowed to use those tokens as the collateral itself, right? And in fact, it's incredibly cumbersome and and a horrible use of a uh, balance sheet to try to use something like the CME. Conversely, right. if you're a TradFi fund and you have real no connectivity in the crypto world, and even you know when you're holding crypto, you're really doing it more synthetically than you are direct, the opposite is true. There'd be no reason to use Deribit and you would basically be forced into using the CME because that's the only place that you already have uh, your line set up and the ability to be as you know uh, collateral efficient as possible, right? But the reality is everybody has some ties to your traditional brokerage lines. And are you suggesting that because of just that ease of use of collateral and being the most capital efficient that almost all volume is going to slight slowly kind of migrate towards these IBIT options, or is there always going to be, you know, different strokes for different folks? No, there's, there's always going to be different strokes. As you say, like there's going to be some venues that are more appropriate for people who are outside the U S some venues, more appropriate for people in the U S some are more retail oriented, like Deribit, I would argue. And then some are more institutionally oriented, like CMA, you know, it'd be hard for an individual to start trading these, um, large size contracts on the, on the CME exchange, um, which are generally reserved for hedge funds and other sophisticated investors. So there's always going to be different ones. What I'm saying is that there are going to be firms like dealing desks and hedge funds that can sit in between all of them, and it's going to result in larger volumes across the board. It's, it's really positive sum for the entire ecosystem. It's, you know, we have to kind of switch our brains from thinking like, oh, this is going to be bad for some people and good for others. It's really generally good for the whole ecosystem and we've kind of seen this multiple times right as like new forms of trading crypto and bitcoin come into um the ecosystem it's always additive really to, to all the players in the space so so does that you know one of the things that we've noticed really since the end of 2022 right even though price has been higher and generally 
you know, a, a little bit of a recovery. There's been basically two areas that were so decimated that haven't come back, right? One is the lending markets, right? Um, you know, clearly the loss of Genesis. Um, and, and to some extent, even, you know, what, what FTX and even like guys like Three Arrows were doing, but really more Genesis. Um, right. And then also the, the just the lack of market makers in general has made liquidity really dry up in the crypto markets. Um, does this does any of that change? Do you does, does this become sort of more of a synthetic lending type market now with the advent of these options? Or does it start to entice more and more market makers who eventually will not just stop at the IBIT options, but they'll start to move? You know, into more uh, uh, spot markets as well. Like, where, how do you think? How do you think of sort of that that more larger, you know, structural impact? Yeah. So this is actually, I think, the the key thing, and it contributes to a couple of big changes. Um, the key idea here is that having an options market that is attached to the ETF will unlock some amount of margin lending against that ETF product. So if we think about, you know, there's like $17 billion, let's say today, that are in the Bitcoin ETF product suite, which is across a, a number of different um, issuers. But all of those um, are going to be at some point, we all hope, eligible to be borrowed against, like you could borrow dollars against them via your prime broker. Um, is obviously going to be some obstacles to that initially because of regulatory issues and sort of the constraints around capital requirements and things like that that are present at banks. But you could see a world where eventually we'll move in that direction. That'll inject a huge amount of U.S. dollar financing into the Bitcoin ecosystem that really is absent today. It was more prevalent last cycle, as you said, because of the, the presence of lending desks like the you know Genesis, Celsius, Nexo, uh, BlockFi crowd, um, but it's being really supplanted in a way by these more traditional forms of lending against um, securitized assets like these ETFs. So what I'm arguing is there's actually going to be a way to sort of better gauge the risk of lending against those ETF products if you can sort of understand the volatility characteristics of that collateral, right? So if you can actually hedge the risk of that by using these options, and the banks themselves or you know the prime brokers themselves can actually conduct that hedging with these options in the same place that they're holding the collateral that actually makes it a safer product for them to offer and ultimately it's going to create more opportunities to you know recycle dollar financing throughout the crypto ecosystem so that has two knock on effects one of which is there's going to be dollars that trickle down from Bitcoin into riskier assets down the curve of crypto, right? And we usually think of that as, you know, ETH, Solana, alternative L1s, um, other altcoins, meme coins, NFTs. You know, you can you can kind of run through the gamut of things that uh, people started trading in a more and more degenerate way, like last cycle. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of see that trickling down. Um, and then the other effect we think is that basically because there's less need to go long crypto on leverage because there's going to be more cash financing available, there's going to be more demand for spot, less demand for forwards or futures. And so that'll compress the basis between those two instruments. Typically right now, if you could look at the forward curve, you know, the forward curve for Bitcoin is something like, uh, you know, seven to nine percent above spot price. Right. Like that should start to compress as there's more financing available. And, and, and do you expect it to compress vol as well? You know, just given that, you know, obviously, you know, once every four years, somebody gets blown up when the VIX jumps to 60 or when, you know, uh, GME, you know, jumps like it did. You talk about GameStop, but like for the most part, investors are trained to be vol sellers, right? It just has been, a, a, you know, certainly covered calls, if not outright, you know, naked calls. Um, do you expect the same sort of appetite for vol selling that's going to ultimately compress vol down to more reasonable because you know again we're, we're a crypto native fund but as you know i've you know most of my team has 10 to 25 plus years of traditional finance we're comfortable with derivatives um you know implied has been above realized for essentially the entire uh, uh, uh duration of crypto options right so we use them sparingly we'd certainly use them a lot more if they were more reflective of what the actual underlying vol was do, where, do, where do you see that going with this? Right, right. So, yeah, they're, they're very astute um, observation. I think there's going to be two things that happen in the vol space. Uh, one is we'll see um, an influx of capital going into the structured product space. Um, in the U.S. market, 
if you look at structured products, these are sort of like packaged instruments that banks will sell to, you know, um, registered investment advisors or their private banking clients. They're generally um, notes that carry some yield or some coupon. So, you know, you're giving up some risk profile or you're entering into some risk profile that gives you some yield in exchange for you giving up maybe upside in some asset, right? So um, the structure that is most common, right, is you, you might enter into a trade where you sell a put option on Bitcoin and then you get in exchange for that some coupon that pays out uh, over the life of the of the note. Let's say the note is a three month note. So that type of structure is a common one that's called like a reverse convertible note um, where you participate on the downside, but on the upside, you receive some sort of fixed yield. So um, that's a pretty common one that we see in equities and, and we expect that to be issued on, on crypto as well. Um, and you can imagine, you know, when there's a lot of these types of notes, they're effectively embedded shortfall uh, option. There's short optionality in that in that structure where uh, the buyer of the note is effectively selling a put option. Um, there's about 100 billion ish of that type of structure across all different assets classes in the US structured note space. Some of that could go into crypto and that would result in some dampening of implied vol because of that supply. So that's one general possibility, right? Um, the other thing that will that we expect to happen is um, there will be some, there's already some differential between things that act as Bitcoin proxies. So think of like Coinbase stock, um, MicroStrategy stock, um, think of all the miners that uh, trade, you know, largely correlated to Bitcoin, but they generally have a much higher sort of daily range, much higher volatility. Mm -hmm. um, these types of instruments right now have options on them. And those options are reflecting the fact that there's not an easy way to sort of like hedge out the underlying data to Bitcoin, like the correlation to Bitcoin. So if you can start introducing, you know, Bitcoin options that are liquid and accessible in the same portfolio as these single name equities, um, we could kind of see like some reduction in the richness of the vols right. in the um, single name assets and then maybe some compression back to Bitcoin. So I think those are the two effects that we'll see. Okay. And take the take the Bitcoin price out of it for a second. But like yeah. I bet is about 22 billion in AUM right now. Um, would you? Is there? And this is maybe my own ignorance, just around the, the you know the overall uh, players in the options market. But like, is there a cohort of funds or RIAs or investors who would be more likely to have a spot position in IBIT, knowing that they can now either hedge it and or do some call overriding? Like, what kind of an AUM increase, you know, just dollar on dollar, would you expect as a result of? Uh, the increased, you know, depth and flexibility now of investing in IBIT. Right. I, I think that's a follow on effect of just unlocking the usability of holding crypto in general, right, that we've seen with the ETF. There has been about $17 billion of net inflows into these products. So you can imagine a lot of that Bitcoin would have been sitting idle somewhere in cold storage or on at a custodian on exchange, um, largely kind of sitting there not doing anything now that they're wrapped in a tradable instrument that is basically accessible to be turned over to create more vol velocity on the asset um and similarly by creating these uh, etf options we'll we'll see even more of that effect right like you can take these instruments you'll you'll see probably more inflows into these instruments more people will hold them with the expectation that they will have some utility to you know write calls against them to be able to hedge them on the downside by buying puts um to structure other creative sort of overlays on a long portfolio and at the end of the day to be able to kind of margin all of it in a single sort of portfolio margin with their prime broker or with with their custodian basically all right great well look i think we're bumping up against time josh this is super informative maybe we'll have you back once they actually start trading here and go, and go deeper in it but uh thank you for joining and thanks everyone uh, again you can find uh what i thought about the markets this week on our blog ar.ca backslash blog you can check out Josh's great thread uh, on his Twitter account at Joshua underscore J underscore Lim. Uh, anything else? Parting notes to uh, for the audience here, Josh? No, that's it. Really excited to uh, see where this takes us. All right, good <clears throat> stuff, man. All right, well, we'll see everybody else again next week. And Josh, good talking to you, pal. Thank you. Great talking to you.